Hello. In the last lecture, we talked about the different forces that lead to mountain building, so how tectonic forces act to create mountains, to lift them up. And in this lecture, we're going to talk about some of the forces that work to grind mountains back down again. Um, so this is glaciers and glacial geomorphology. So what we'll talk about is first, what is geomorphology? Uh, we'll talk about glaciers, what they are, different types of glaciers, and then we'll talk a little bit about how glaciers shape landscapes, the different erosional landforms that they create, and then some of the sediments, so the way that glaciers move rock and other material from one place to another. Uh, in the next lecture, we'll talk a bit more about depositional landforms, so how glaciers deposit sediment once they're finished moving it from one place to another, as well as different subglacial landforms. Uh, but I think we've got enough to, to get through here, so we'll just hop right in. So the first topic is geomorphology. And of course, it's natural to say we need to ask, what is geomorphology? Well, it's the science of understanding the different processes and forces that shape the Earth's surface. Um, so if you look here at the uh, image to the right of the screen, we have a nice uh, plateau feature somewhere in the American Southwest. You can see this nice column, this nice flat top, and then you can also see this talus slope that has formed at the base of the st structure. And then you can see the, there's a very flat uh, area around it. And you might also notice that there's some horizontal layers that are visible within this structure. And as you can see from the series of images here, we have some rocks that have broken off of the top and fallen down to the bottom of this talus pile, uh, kicking up plenty of dust and sediment. Um, so geomorphology is a way of describing these processes of studying and understanding how they work. Um, the different forces that we might be interested in are including things like air, so how, uh, how chemicals in the air, uh, how wind can shape landscapes. Um, we can also talk about water and how it shapes landscapes, what we'll talk about today, which is ice, and then also biology, life. Uh, can also help shape landscapes. Um, so in general, lands, landforms and landscapes are produced by erosion, so removal of sediments or breaking down of sediments and deposition, so how they're moved from wherever they're eroded and how they're put uh, in their current location. And as you might imagine, uh, in addition to what we talked about on the previous slide, uh, climate can play a big role in how, or in, in climate can play a big role in the processes that shape uh, landscapes. So if you think here, this picture of sand dunes, um, the processes acting here in this very dry desert environment are going to be quite different from the processes that shape, for example, beaches in Britain where it's a bit more humid, maybe a bit cooler. Um, we have different, different processes happening. Um, so like I said, how landscapes change can depend greatly on the climactic setting. Uh, different processes can produce different landforms and they can produce different landforms in different ways. So for example here, uh, water and wind erosion, so sediment and rock being broken down by water and wind, lead to what are called sorted sediments. So we get uh, sort of larger, we, we get layers that are sort of sorted by the size or by the, the, uh, the mass of the different particles. So we get the larger boulders and then we get gravels and smaller material on top of that. And then finally sort of sand and, uh, and dust. Um, whereas erosion from glaciers uh, tends to lead to more mixed sediments. So we, instead of these nice layers that we might see, we actually have uh, a much more mixed um, 
um, version of, of deposition. And we'll talk more about this uh, as the lecture goes on. Um, vegetation, as I mentioned, can also have an impact on how landscapes change. For example, uh, tree roots and other large, uh, other large systems um, can inhibit erosion, so they prevent wind and water from uh, from removing sediment, or they might sort of direct where that sediment goes. Um, so all of these things play a big role, and of course, vegetation has uh, has a very interactive role with climate as well. So that leads us to what is a glacier? And very simply put, a glacier is a perennial mass of ice and snow that moves under its own weight. And it's the moving under its own weight that is the key here. Um, they tend to form over the course of several decades to maybe uh, longer, longer term, so centuries. Um, it largely depends on the climate, so how much, uh, so what the temperature is, how much precipitation, uh, the density of the snow that comes down, all of that plays a role in how fast glaciers form uh, over different time scales. Um, so typical ice speeds for glaciers go from near stagnation, so there's almost no detectable motion, uh, to in some cases, uh, glaciers in Greenland and Antarctica have been uh, observed to move at over 20 kilometers in a year. Um, so this example of a glacier in the Alps uh, have, probably has flow speeds that are somewhere on the order of a few hundred meters per year at a maximum. Um, so these are, that's more sort of the typical range of flow speeds that one might expect to see um, for glaciers in the Alps. So we can look at the anatomy of a glacier. So we'll talk about the different parts of the glacier. Um, so starting at the very top, so the head of the glacier, uh, which usually forms in a cirque basin, which we'll talk about um, in a few slides. Um, so this is at the highest elevations, and this is where most of the snow uh, is falling and where it remains after, uh, after a given year. So then we also have what's called fern. So this, so we're now moving down, down the glacier. So starting from here, so we're now looking at the fern area. So fern is a is snow that has made it through at least one melt season. So it falls in the winter, uh, it remains through the summer melt season. It metamorphoses a little bit because of the temperature differences, because of melting, um, but then it's it's still in place on the glacier after the year or after the summer or the melt season is over. Uh, as we're moving further down, we go from the fern area to what's called the fern line. And this is just the transition between fern and snow or fern and bare ice, depending on, um, depending on which direction we're going. Um, so as we're going down, we're going from fern to bare ice. And of course, this changes throughout the year because in the winter, you have snow that covers often all the way down to the base of the glacier uh, and potentially beyond. Um, as we keep going, we have a medial moraine. So this is just a pile of debris that's in the middle of the glacier. And we'll talk a lot more about that in the next lecture on depositional landforms. Um, we also can see plenty of crevasses so these are cracks in the glacier surface that form under tension. Um, so as the ice is flowing, parts of it might be flowing a bit faster um, than other parts. And so it kind of pulls apart, or sometimes we get the opposite where you have a, where you have a fast flowing region moving into a slower moving region and you get a compressional stress regime. Um, and so these are fractures that form because of differences in stress. Um, finally, we get down to the very end of the glacier and we have uh, what's called either the tongue or the terminus. So this is just the end of the glacier. And then of course, running throughout all of this, we have what's called the bed and that's just the base of the glacier. So where we go, uh, the, bottom, <clears throat> the bottom of the ice um, 
Yeah, there's some other terms that are um, that are displayed on this figure, and some of them we'll talk more about uh, as we as we go on in the next couple of lectures. Um, but you're welcome to you know, go and and look up some of these different terms uh, on your own. Okay, so glaciers change mass. I'm sure this is not a, a new concept for a lot of you because we have, you know, there's plenty of talk in the news about different glaciers, um, how much mass they're losing, how much, well, okay, at this point in time, it's how much mass they're losing. Um, and so we, we try to divide glaciers up into different regions based on where they are gaining or losing mass. You know, so a glacier might overall be losing mass, but parts of it um, are actually sort of gaining mass or constant, depending on the uh, depending on particular circumstances. So if we're starting up at the top of the glacier again, we have what's called the accumulation zone, and this is where we are accumulating mass. So we're we're getting more mass input in the form of snowfall or blowing snow or some other processes that we won't need to worry too much about. Um, so we get more mass coming in than we have mass going out. Um, so that's typically the, again, the, the upper part of the glacier where we have this transition between the area where we're losing more or where we're gaining more mass and losing more mass is what's called the equilibrium line. So this is where we have sort of no net change in glacier mass from one year to the next. Um, below the equilibrium line, we have what is called the ablation zone. So this is where we're losing more mass than we're getting. And the main processes that we lose mass on a glacier are uh, mostly through melt. So we can have what's called subaerial melt. And this is just where ice is sitting out uh, in the uh, sitting out in the air and the difference, so warmer air temperatures or precipitation are causing the ice to melt. We can also have what's called submarine melting, um, which is where ice that is below the water line, in the case of glaciers that make it down to a lake or to the ocean, are, um, are melting below uh, the water. So the water is actually acting to melt the ice. Um, Sublimation is another process where we're going directly from ice to water vapor. Um, we won't, we don't normally need to worry too much about that because it's not a particularly common process around most of the world. And then the last, uh, the last main process for losing mass that we'll mention is calving. So this is where big blocks of ice are breaking off of a glacier and falling into the ocean, or in some cases, rotating out of the, the water, uh, depending on the size of the glacier, how deep the ocean is, and so on. So if we now go from talking about the different parts of a glacier to looking at different examples of glacier types, uh, the, we'll start with the very simplest example, which is what's called a cirque. So a cirque glacier, uh, is a sort of round, circular-shaped glacier that forms in a bowl-shaped depression of a mountain wall. Uh, here in the UK, you might also hear them called quarries, or if you're in Wales, I think they're called coombs. Um, so this is just a, a depression that has been carved out by a glacier, and it's usually in a sort of circular shape, which is where we get surf. Um, these are typically small, so uh, maybe less than a couple kilometers in diameter. And cert glaciers are typically flowing pretty um, pretty slow because they're not, they don't tend to be super thick. Um, and ice thickness is one of the big controlling factors for how fast glaciers flow. Um, so this example here, I just highlighted the, um, highlighted the cirque basin, this small glacier here, and then showing the arrow pointing the direction of glacier flow. So moving now from cirques to slightly larger glaciers, we have what are called valley glaciers. And so these are the sort of classic examples that you might see um, from the Alps. 
So these are the longer glaciers that are flowing down through steep valleys. So they're bounded by valley walls and they're coming out of either mountains or uh, as we'll talk about in a couple of slides, ice fields, ice caps, ice sheets. So these are these are just glaciers that are flowing through um, through a valley. And in each of these two examples here, I've just drawn in arrows to show the direction that the ice is flowing. You can see we're flowing around bends in a lot of cases. Uh, and we'll talk more about that as we get into erosional uh, landforms. So another type of glacier that we'll talk about is what's called a Piedmont glacier. Um, so Piedmont glaciers form when valley glaciers sort of get to the end of the valley and they get into the lowlands at the base of a mountain range and they kind of spread out in this nice sort of pancakey shape. Um, so this is an example from somewhere in Arctic Canada where you see lots of different examples of Piedmont glaciers all in one place. Another very famous example from Alaska, this is the Malaspina Glacier. Uh, and you can also see some really cool folding features on the surface. Um, so you have these thick bands of sediment that are on the surface of the glacier. And as it's flowing, you're, you're getting sort of compressional folding features uh, in the surface, much like what we talked about in the mountain, um, in the mountain building lectures and the um, and the crustal deformation lecture. Okay, so moving now from Piedmont glaciers to what are called ice fields. So these are large interconnected masses of ice that cover mountainous topography. Um, so you're basically forming a glacier on top of a mountain and you can still see the mountains within the glacier topography. Um, so this example is the, uh, this is the Harding Ice Field in Alaska and the Southern Patagonian Ice Field in South America. And you can see plenty of mountain peaks sticking up through the glaciers. These mountain peaks are what are called ninotaks. Um, they're formed, uh, or they're not formed, but they're, they're named after the uh, Greenlandic word for a mountain that is sticking out of a glacier. Um, yeah, so these are so ice fields again. They're they're glaciers that you can actually see the bedrock topography um, in the glacier, and the shape is determined by bedrock topography. We can also have what are called ice caps, and these are these are glaciers where they might be overlying mountainous topography but the glacier has completely overridden most of the surrounding topography. Um, so they tend to be dome-shaped. Um, so examples here from the Russian Arctic in, uh, I think this is uh, October, Re October Revolution Island in Saranaya Zemlya. Um, you can see plenty of different examples of large and small ice caps. Um, ice caps go up to about 50,000 kilometers squared, and after that we call them ice sheets. Um, here we have an example from Iceland. Uh, this is um that is um, one of the classic examples of an ice sheet, and it's actually covering several volcanoes um, as well. So now we get to what are called ice sheets. Um, so ice sheets are, like I said, glaciers that are larger than 50,000 square kilometers. Um, in the present day, we only have two different, um, we have two different ice sheets or two main ice sheet areas, uh, one in Greenland, and then we have the Antarctic ice sheet, which you might also see broken into two distinct pieces, the East Antarctic Ice Sheet and the West Antarctic Ice Sheet. Um, so Greenland is about 1.7 million square kilometers. Uh, Antarctica is almost 10 times more than that. So it's a very, very large part, uh, a very, very large piece of ice. Uh, and in fact, it contains more than 50% of all of the fresh water on Earth. And I believe it's Antarctica alone that contains enough ice to raise sea level by almost 70 meters, 
if it were to melt entirely. Um, so this is, yeah, so these are, these are big pieces of ice that sort of completely dominate the, the landscape that they're flowing over and it's what's shaped a great deal of uh, Northern Europe and especially the British Isles um, as well as parts of uh, North America, Northern Asia, as well as South America and uh, even Africa going further back in time, as we mentioned during the um, during the first lectures on plate tectonics. Uh, so ice sheets have played a big role in in shaping landscapes all over the world, all throughout uh, the history of Earth. Um, if we then move into sort of smaller regions of an ice sheet, uh, we might see what are called ice streams. So these are areas of the ice sheet that are flowing much, much faster than the surrounding ice. Um, so you see an example here from Antarctica. This is uh, the ice streams flowing into the Ross ice shelf uh, along the Seipel coast. Um, and you see that the ice surrounding these ice streams is flowing fairly low so somewhere down in the, you know, under, maybe under a kilometer or under a few hundred meters per year. Uh, and you move on to these ice streams and you're seeing uh, speeds in excess of uh, three to four, up to 10 kilometers per year. Uh, so these are, uh, these are very fast flowing portions of the ice and they serve to sort of drain the ice sheet. Um, they can also switch on and off. We're not completely sure why that is. Uh, it's still one of the big open-ended questions, um, but we know that they can go active and inactive throughout time. Um, so it's a, an interesting problem in glaciology. Um, in this image, you can also see the Ross Ice Shelf, which is another uh, example of a type of glacier, uh, which is an ice shelf. So this is just a large, flat, floating mass of ice that is attached to land on at least one side. So the ice tends to be thickest uh, on the landward side, so where it's flowing out from the coast, and it gets thinner as it goes further and further away from the coast. Um, the point where ice actually starts floating is what's known as the grounding line, um, and in in the present day, most of the ice shelves that we see around the planet are in Antarctica. Uh, most of the ice shelves in Greenland and other parts of the Arctic have uh, disintegrated over the last couple of decades as the climate has warmed. So that is different types of glaciers. And now we're going to move further into talking about what happens as glaciers shape landscapes. So the first thing that we'll talk about is what's called glacial erosion and the main processes by which this happens. Um, so first, glaciers pick up small rocks or clasts uh, that they've broken off of the underlying bedrock. Um, so typically, so this is, this is a process called plucking or quarrying. So we have rock that is fractured. It has joints that are uh, already existing in the rock, and as um, as the ice is flowing over it, we get meltwater that percolates into these fractures. If it refreezes, that that meltwater then expands. It breaks the rock pieces off, and they get picked up by the ice. Um, and so, as then these pieces of uh, rock are stuck in the ice, um, they can sort of scrape along the bedrock underneath. This is a process that's called abrasion. Uh, so it's just the polishing and scraping of the bedrock um, by clasts that are that are picked up by the ice. Um, and this leaves often these striations or striped patterns in bedrock. And this happens over very different length scales. So the example here that you can see is a rock that has these very clear striation patterns on it, this is happening on a scale of maybe a couple of meters. So you can see the small child here for scale. Um, and then if we're now looking at a slightly larger scale, this is an example from Yosemite National Park in the United States. 
Um, and this is a very, this is, this is a very large, uh, basically a mountain. It's about, I want to say 800 meters tall. Um, yeah, that sounds about right. So it's about 800 meters tall. Maybe not from where the trees are, but it's, it's a very large rock. Um, and you can see that ice has flowed over it. At some point in the past, it has sort of smoothed out a lot of these features. Um, and it's also steepened the side downstream. So these are, you can see that in the smaller rock as well. So we have this sort of long, smooth, uh, what's called the stoss or the upstream side of this feature. Uh, and then we have a more rugged, um, steeper section on the lee slope. So the downstream side of the, um, the downstream side of this bedrock feature. Um, and these are also, you might hear them called roche Montaigne, uh, or I think also whalebacks is another term um, because they sort of look like whales breaching in the ocean. Um, yeah, but you can see the, you can see the very large striations that are happening as well as on a much finer scale. Um, some more examples of uh, striation. And of course, because of the way that these are aligned, it tells us something about the direction that the glacier was flowing as it was moving over these rocks. Um, so you see here that this, this glacier was flowing sort of from the right of the image to the left. And we know that because of the difference in shape of the feature. Same thing here, flowing right to left. Here it's a little bit harder to tell, but in this image it's flowing sort of down valley, um, which it's hard to see because this is just bedrock that's been striated. Okay. So on a landscape on a landscape scale, glaciers also form uh, different features that we can see after they have retreated. Um, and some of these we can see around the UK, even though it's been over 10,000 years since there have been glaciers here. Um, but you can see them in other glaciated landscapes as well. Um, and so this is just a schematic of what this region looks like while there is a glacier or while there are glaciers flowing through the landscape. And then what is left after the glaciers have all, um, have all retreated and melted away. And we'll talk about each of these different features that we see in turn. So the first of these landforms that we'll talk about are what are called cirques. We've already talked about them because these are the landforms where cirque glaciers tend to form. Um, these are just the, the small bowl-shaped depression uh, in a mountain wall that are formed where we originally have a mountainside. There are irregularities in the mountainside, so it's not a completely smooth surface. And as snow falls and the glacier begins to form, uh, those irregularities get enhanced because of the plucking action that we talked about, as well as a process called frost heaving. Um, and over long periods of time, that tends to sort of dig out this bowl shape, um, removing more and more sediment. Um, as I mentioned before, glaciers preferentially uh, will be eroding the floor of this, uh, of this basin rather than the headwall. So you get this sort of deepening that occurs. Uh, and once the glacier has completely um, completely melted away, you might be left with what is called a tarn. So this is just a small lake that has formed in the depression uh, that the glacier uh, carved out. So where we then, so where we have uh, multiple cirques coming together uh, or forming on a, a peak, we might end up with what is called a horn. So this is a sharp pyramid-shaped peak that has been carved out by glaciers. Um, so these happen when we have at least 
three different cert glaciers coming together on a single mountain peak, and they carve out a cirque basin on each flank. Um, so you can see an example here on this peak where I've outlined um, one of these cirque basins that's sort of hidden by this um, by this ridge line. Uh, we see another cirque basin up here, and then there's another, at least another one on the other side of this uh, on the other side of this ridge line uh, here towards the right of the image. Um, yeah. So again, because we're we're getting this preferential erosion on the floor of the cirque. Um, it, it sort of steepens and, and carves down the mountainside um, and enhances this sort of uh, peak feature. Um, if you're looking for sort of the classic example of this, uh, the Matterhorn in Switzerland is sort of it. Um, it is the, you know, sort of uh, quintessential example of a horn uh, that has been formed by glacial erosion. We might also, uh, sort of moving down, um, we're now looking at a landform that's called an arete, and this is the sharp ridge line that can form between two different glacial valleys. Um, so they can form in a way similar to horns, where you have two different cirques on either side of a, uh, of a ridge or a peak that then erode out basins, leaving this sharp, uh, steep headwall um, or sharp, sharp, steep ridge line that we can see in this picture here. Um, but they can also form when we have glaciers that are flowing parallel to each other in two different valleys separated by a ridge line. Um, that, that glacier flow through parallel valleys can also form this sort of sharp ridge-like feature. I mentioned a few times the glacier valleys. So these are valleys that have been carved out by glaciers. So when glaciers form and as they flow, they tend to widen and deepen valleys that already existed in the landscape. Um, because glaciers have a wider cross section than rivers, um, they're spreading out their uh, the, eros the erosive force over a much larger area, and so they tend to deepen the valley floor and leave the sides in a much um, leave the sides much steeper. So we form this classic U shape rather than the more uh, traditional V shape that we see with a, with a stream valley. Um, ice is viscous as well, uh, so it's more viscous than water. So as it's flowing through rough landscapes, it tends to smooth and sort of steer uh, any, of the, um, any of the sharper turns that you might see in the valley. Uh, and this can form what are called truncated spurs. So we have a ridge line that originally pokes out into the valley, and as the glacier flows, it sort of crops off that um, that ridge line, and it forms a sort of triangular peak um, at the edge of the valley. We might also see what are called hanging valleys. Um, so where we have different, we have glaciers flowing into each other. Uh, we have what's called the tributary glacier. So this is a smaller glacier that's flowing into a larger glacier. Um, so because it's a smaller glacier, it's less thick. It's going to erode less than the larger glacier that it's flowing into, what is called the trunk glacier. And so um, as a result, over long periods of time, the main valley where the larger glacier is flowing erodes much, much, much more, much deeper than this tributary valley. And so once the ice retreats, you're left with a valley floor, um, or you're left with a, a valley that is you know, sometimes hundreds of meters above the, uh, the main valley floor that, it's, uh, that it had been flowing into. Um, so these are sort of, this is a sort of a classic example, I think, from Yosemite National Park in the U.S. We see these in lots of other uh, deglaciated lands landscapes. 
Another glacial landform that we'll take a look at is what's called a fjord. So this is a, a deep, narrow, long uh, embayment in a body of water, usually uh, the ocean. Um, so this is carved out by a glacier, and it's basically just a glacier valley that has been submerged as the glacier has retreated. Um, so when you have lots of very, very thick ice, it is able to carve very deep below sea level. So it can, um, so this glacier in the picture here uh, probably goes down at least 100 to 200 meters below the, uh, below the water line that we can see here. Um, so the glaciers can actually extend as far as several thousands of meters below sea level, depending on how thick the ice is. And so as a result, you get these long, these, these deep um, depressions that are getting carved out. And then once you have the ice retreat away from that, it gets filled in by water. Um, yeah, so the, the sort of classic landscape example for fjords is, of course, Western Norway, uh, where you have lots and lots of examples of these, uh, these features that have been carved out over the last several different glacial periods. So I mentioned that glaciers transport sediment. So glaciers, um, you know, they're eroding sediment uh, up in the mountains, and as they're sort of flowing down out of the mountains, they're bringing that sediment with them. And they can bring it in a couple of different ways. So one example uh, where we have sediment that's on top of the glacier, we might call that supraglacial sediment. Uh, if it's being transported beneath the glacier, it's called subglacial sediment. Uh, and it can also be uh, what's called entrained within the, in the glacier, so where it's actually sort of moved into the ice and it's being carried along with the ice. Uh, so then once that ice melts, uh, that sediment is then deposited on the landscape. Uh, and we have a couple of different terms to refer to sediment that has been deposited by glaciers. The sort of catch-all term, so the word for any sort of sediment that has been moved and carved by glaciers is glacial drift. Um, if it has been deposited by the glacier itself, uh, we call it till. And if it is deposited by meltwater from the glacier, we call it stratified drift. So because it's being deposited by meltwater, it tends to have uh, a, a stratified composition where we have um, the, different, the different components of the sediment sorted out by size um, because of the action of the water. So like I said, till is the usually unsorted sediment that is deposited directly by glaciers. Remember that ice is not sorting sediment by size because it's not, it, it's not flowing the same way that water is flowing. Um, so till can range in size from very fine rock flour. So this is the, the, very, um, the very, very fine almost dust particles that are ground down by glaciers. Uh, you can see in this image here uh, a pool of water that actually has some rock flower or some glacial flowers suspended in it, uh, giving it this sort of very classic cloudy, milky color or milky, um, yeah, milky color. Um, so till can range from that size of particle all the way up to very large boulders. And we'll talk some more about that in the next lecture. Uh, it's, you, you also, uh, if you're looking in, in deglaciated landscapes, um, you'll typically see that the class have been uh, scratched and polished. So again, remember they're being scraped along on the bedrock as the glacier is flowing. And so they're often, um, they're often sort of shaped and changed by that, uh, by that process. Um, we can also classify till based on how and where till 
has been deposited. So if it's subglacial till, we might call it lodgement till, if it has been directly lodged in place by the glacier. Um, so just this, you can sort of refer to this diagram for each of these different terms. Um, if it has been um, sort of deposited by meltwater running underneath the glacier, uh, it might we would call it subglacial meltout till. Um, and then it can also be um, Uh, it can also be termed deformation till if it's sort of in this layer of sediment that the glacier is sliding over and, and deforming as it's as it's moving. Um, okay, if it's deposited on the top of the glacier, superglacial till, um, and if it has been deposited by meltwater, or sorry, if it's been deposited as it melts out of the glacier, we would call it supraglacial meltout. Um, we can also get flow till that is uh, happening as a result of sort of being pushed by the glacier as it's flowing along. And you might also see something called sublimation till. But as I mentioned uh, earlier in this lecture, sublimation is not a particularly common process for most glaciers around the world, so this is not something we need to uh, to worry too much about. Um, I'll just leave this uh, different table of the characteristics of different types of till, depending on um, whether it's subglacial or supraglacial, how it has been deposited, whether it's you know, lodgement or melt out or so on. Um, and it just goes through the different shapes and sizes and, and types of um, um, types of characteristics that we see with these sediments. Um, so that is it for glaciers and glacial geomorphology, or at least the first part of glacial geomorphology. Um, so there's a nice list of different uh, videos from the textbook that you can uh, watch here. Uh, there's also a number of sort of virtual field trip videos. These are a little bit longer, um, but they take, they, they sort of go to different places around the world. I think there's Alaska and Iceland um, looking at glaciers and different glacial features. Um, there's also this link down here that um, just actually came out a couple of days ago from a big UK, actually global project um, looking at the Patagonian ice, the, sorry, the Patagonian ice fields and how those have changed over long periods of time. So you can look at all of the different um, sort of glacial geomorphology features that have been mapped. You can look at the reconstruction of the Patagonian ice fields and ice sheets throughout time. Um, so this is a, a link that I highly recommend. Um, and then you can also go look at uh, this chapter in the textbook if you have access. Um, so the next lecture will be on uh, glacial geomorphology. So it's going to be more talking about the different uh, landforms that are formed when glaciers deposit sediment uh, on the landscape, as well as uh, different landforms that are made underneath a glacier as it's flowing along. Um, so I hope that this was interesting and helpful. And uh, again, if you have any questions or comments or concerns, uh, just please feel, feel free to email me. All right, thanks, bye.